Hello, good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Miguel Garcia Garibay. I'm the, a professor in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry and also the Dean of Physical Sciences. And it is uh, a real pleasure to welcome you all uh, today for this uh, really interesting event. Um, let me just uh, tell you that uh, we in the Division of Physical Sciences uh, have the opportunity to host uh, some of these events periodically. And just so you will be, you, you heard about this one, you'll be hearing about other ones. And we really, really want to connect with all of you. We want to really be more relevant uh, with a community that supports us. Uh, we, we are very excited about sharing the excitement of our science, uh, the excitement of everybody who's behind our science, which is our students, uh, undergraduates and graduates, and really to acknowledge that a lot of that is possible thanks uh, to the support of many, many of you. You probably know that uh, w the contribution of the state of California to the UCLA budget is less than sales tax. It's about, it's about 7%. <laughs> Yet, the quality of our education hasn't declined one bit. In fact, it continues increasing despite uh, challenging uh, budgeting conditions. And that's just not happens because of, you know, spontaneously, it's because we, we are so blessed to have the engagement of so many of you in the community. So for us, uh, opportunities like this is, is really, in a way, an opportunity to give back to you, to, to tell you about the exciting science that is going on, and really, to again, to, to maintain you engaged and to ask you to spread the word. Tell your friends about everything that is going on at UCLA, which I think is just phenomenal, and really we're counting on you on that. Uh, as you know, this is a phenomenal city, a great state, and it is said that UCLA has 500,000 living alumni. In my mind, that is the biggest asset that this university has, right? Our students today are clearly important, but so many of you who are Bruins are, are so successful, and the more you support us in every possible way, I think the more successful we will continue to be, and our mission will continue as it was since the beginning, despite the fact that the state is not really supporting us to any significant extent. So, so today, actually, we get to hear about some really groundbreaking research that is very unique and really you will only see happening at UCLA. Uh, the, the conjunction of artificial intelligence, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, um, various types of learning, virtual reality, and really ideas and concepts that my esteemed colleague, uh, Maya Meta, has been elaborating here in our campus for a few years. So he is really a treasure to our campus. He is a wonderful colleague, and I'm, I'm delighted to invite him to please uh, tell us about his work. Ah, I, th I, I think we have a, a, a few words from, uh, <laughs> uh, so David Salzberg is the, the chair of the Department of Physics and Astronomy. Please, David. Thanks, okay, thanks, you, thanks Miguel. Usually we have the more important person go next, but that's okay. <laughs> uh, so you're gonna hear about some fantastic research, and um, I want to point out, when I talk to undergraduates, for example, why they come to UCLA and not someplace else, it's because they want to interact with the faculty that are doing real cutting edge research, inventing new techniques, and learning new science. And that's why they come here. We have 12,000 slots open a year. We get 100,000 applications for those slots. Um, and of those, 100 per year graduate from physics and astronomy. Um, another interesting thing is half of the students that come to UCLA are on some form of financial aid. And so uh, beyond the state support, um, the support for from many sources including uh, private donors, one third of our students have Pell Grants, which means their families earn less than 50000 a year. And they're here at UCLA and you can see that we can, we can work with these students while doing the highest level research and that's why UCLA is this upward mobility machine, which is like what we, what we like to talk about it. So you're gonna hear about this amazing research, it's gonna seem very high level, but I want you to know I see undergraduates coming and going, graduate students coming and going out of Professor Meta's lab all the time. So it's shared right up and down the ladder. So without any further ado, we'll turn it over to Professor Meta. Thank you. 
Thanks, Miguel and David, for introducing me. And thanks to all of you for showing up here on this beautiful evening. Uh, so you might have some ideas about memory. Uh, I'm sure all of you have some ideas about memory, but you just can't remember. Right? <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. That's joke number one. <laughs> so, so anybody wants to give an idea of what do you think is memory? Any, any volunteer? Just anything. What do you think is memory? Anybody? Don't be shy. Yes, please. Oh, he's going to put me out of job. <laughs> Beautiful. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Amazing. What's your name? <laughs> Fantastic, Khan. So you introduced way better than I could, <laughs> right? Thank you. That was planted, by the way. You know, I, I told you, right? No. <laughs> so, so there's something going on, right? We think that memory is a very complex thing. It depends on the experience you had in childhood. When I eat something that burns my tongue like hell, I say, whoa, I'm here. That's a good food. You're going to say, what's wrong? Take this food away if you're not me. So it depends on weird associations and so on. But that kind of memory is something that we can do very little about because it's so damn complicated. We are, I'm going to tell you in excruciating detail, uh, not too painful, about how complicated that is. But as you can see, I live in two different departments. Physics and astronomy is one, so that doesn't count, and neurology. So in physics, we like to think of things as you know, people were looking at the stars, what is the universe, they had turtles and elephants, and people said, you know, forget about turtles and elephants. Let's think of just a pendulum. <coughs> just think of a frictionless inclined plane, right? Which doesn't exist even today, right? And that's how we made progress. So I want to demonstrate to you the core of memory right now, all right? So any number of people who want to participate in the experiment, please stand up. Don't hesitate. Nothing nasty will happen to you. It's going to be a question that I'll be asking you. All right? So everybody ready? All right? Now I'm going to be asking you to do one thing and one thing alone. So take a deep breath. Focus. All right? Focus deeply. And now I'm going to ask you to do one thing and Focus on what the answer is. I'm going to ask you to lift your right hand. Don't do it yet. Don't do it yet. Tell me which is the first muscle that moved when you lifted your right hand. Go. Anybody? Thank you. Have a seat. <laughs> Think about it. Brain is a good answer. I wish my brain had muscles. I could go to the gym and I'll be all set. Yes. Eyes. Eyes, very good, uh, but if you close your eyes, not necessarily, right? Not necessarily. Anybody else? Thumb. Thumb, maybe, maybe. Any? Sorry? Biceps. Biceps, very good. Anybody else? I'm going to prove to you that, you know. Shoulders, very good. Anybody else? I'm going to give you a hint. Simple physics says that none of this could be true. None of this, right? It's, go it's going to be magic. So I give you a hint. Hint is in physics. All right. Let me give you the answer. I am a, a vertical thing out of equilibrium. If I do this, I'm going to fall on my nose. And you know, nose like this, you've got to be careful. <laughs> so the, your center of gravity went forward. The first muscle to move is at the back of your leg, exactly in proportional to this. And your brain calculated. How much is the weight on your backpack? How much do you weigh? Don't tell anybody. Uh, how much was the wind speed? How much was the incline? All of it was calculated right then and there, and you didn't even know. And if you don't believe this, don't put it on me. Go and stand on a cliff at the edge. You feel that weird thing at the back? That's your brain saying, dude, bad idea. It's pulling you, right? So memory. 
the memory that we think is this amazingly complicated thing is made of tiny, tiny atoms. And lots of them get strung together to create memories. And these atoms are the stuff that we want to get into. So let's start with some really complex memories. So that's the big picture, right? We have about that much tissue right there inside. Uh, brain, 1 50th the size of the body. Still about 20 to 30% of energy consumed by our bodies by the brain. So it's consuming a lot of energy. And as their kids consume a lot more energy, as we grow older, consumes less and less energy. I don't know what that means. Uh, and we want to understand the mind is what we are using to understand. We think that's memory. We speak. I said, hello, how are you? How was your day? Well, there is memory coming in right there. What's your name? Uh, those things get messed up when people, people get Alzheimer's. So that's what I want to study and figure out. Now, you may ask, why are you doing this in the physics department? What has this got to do with physics? This is all neurology. So the way it began was many, many years ago. <clears throat> in fact, as he pointed out, when I was a kid. So that's the street on which I was living. That's the picture I downloaded today. So it's not exactly what I was brought up with. But down that road, if you go, uh, there is another little compound. And uh, why does this freeze right now? That's a good question. Uh, it didn't like this picture, I think. It's not too nice. And that's a view from my balcony. Not now, of course. For some reason, people in India want to wear white clothes in that background. I don't know why. So I remember a day like this. On a day like this, I was this big. My mother was that huge in my mind. And I told her, what is this mathematics business? Give me some problem to solve. And I was like super into math. She said, what's wrong with you? Just go out and play. <laughs> I said, no, 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 I'm bored. I, I broke enough things. Give me something to like calculate. So, and then I said, what is all this stuff going on around us? So how do we make sense and so on? So somebody said, you know, if you want to do all this, go do study physics. That's where all the answers are about what's the universe and so on. So off I went. Uh, of course, I did quantum physics. Wrote lots of papers. Uh, that's the paper I'm most proud of, the Euclid Euclidean continuation of Dirac fermion. Uh, and it's a really interesting paper. Uh, but as I wrote those papers, I found that it was very difficult to convey those results to people. And at times, I thought, what's going on? How come I am able to make sense of these complicated things, such as how the universe began, even though none of us have experienced this? How does the brain take information and not just write it down on a computer, but turn into something amazing. Turn into something that you have never experienced, nor will experience. How? And as I started to think about it, I realized that while I think that I am so amazingly smart, uh, not so smart. Not so smart. So look at that bird. Uh, there are these birds that are going across the pole to pole, round trip, just on the wings, no GPS, no in-flight service. Uh, none of it. Uh, they, not, they navigate on open space. So that's one amazing thing. They can do that. Stamina, memory from the tiny bird brain. Insane. We still don't know how they do it. People say maybe they sense magnetic field, but so what? How do they have a giant map? The funny thing is not that they can navigate, but while they're navigating, then it swoop, they dive down into the ocean and they pick up bits of fish. We know that. That is weird, because the bird has never experienced water underneath whatever is going on, nor has fish ever flown, barring few exceptions. How do they agree on the precise sense of where that fish is going to be? At what time? Off by just 50 to 100 milliseconds, the birds will eat too many fish. They will never migrate. Fish die off, planet ends. Or if the birds are just a little too slow by 10 milliseconds, that's one hundredth of a second. Bird never catches fish. Fish get too fat. Birds die. All right. So, and this is going on across all species. Totally different species. They agree on space and time. So you say, okay, it's, what's the big deal? I can see space and time. Well, you're looking at this thing when you're looking here. 
there's something gray here, there's something red here, there's something else. That's what your eyes see. And then your brain is creating that concept of that distance. It doesn't exist. I can do another experiment. I can ask you to come here after 10 seconds and stick your finger here. You will do that. Then I'll ask you what is here. You'll say space. Well, what is that space? So physicists have thought about it for the longest time. Person who discovered calculus, Leibniz thought space is made of little blocks of monads that cannot be moved. Newton has his ideas of space and time. Einstein had famously and so on. So how, what has that space got to do with intelligence, abstract ideas, and how does the brain create any of this in the first place? Well, clearly it's somewhere in the brain, some magic happens. Uh, our brain has lots of neurons, 100 billion neurons, 80 billion if you are really precise. And when I say this, we all are supposed to be impressed. Well, let me give you a hint. That is not the most impressive thing. Because 100 billion neurons are, neurons are cells. My foot has more than 100 billion cells. If this talk was about my foot, I don't think you'll show up. <laughs> so what's the deal with it? 100 billion is not so impressive. Bezos can buy it $1 each. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> right, easy. What they cannot be done is the connections between neurons. There are 100 trillion connections. Each neuron is connecting to 10,000 other neurons, 10,000, while average cell in your body connects to about 12. That's it. So the biology has gone out of the way to generate these special kinds of things which connect to 10,000 things. In fact, it's even weirder. Neurons connect to 10,000 inputs and then transmit whatever they do, which we're going to look into, to other 10,000 neurons, pretty much like average Twitter user. You get something from someone, send it to somebody else. It's all totally biological. So there is some magic there. Turns out, if I distill all the things about memory, that memory is stored in each one of those connections. Less than a micrometer. What is the micrometer? The cross section of your head is about 100 micrometers. So how does that happen? That's like not even a drop in the bucket. So people have looked at this for the longest time for at least 60 years, and this is the circuit of just the visual part of the brain. No emotions, nothing else, just the vision. Down here is the eye, and then you have a whole lot of areas, and this map is actually 30 years old. It's even more complicated. So where do we start? That's hard, and these huge revolution that's going on called deep networks, this is your deep network. That's what it's based on. This is a neocortex, the convoluted surface that you identify as the brain, but that's just 10% of your brain. All the way at the end is the tiny little area called HC that you can't even see, called hippocampus. That's the farthest removed from the center. Turns out that's almost at the center of your brain. It's one of the oldest part of the brain. Snakes have it, and the shape and the content biological content has remained virtually invariant. That's the part that perceives space. Now you know why a fish and a bird and a snake and a zebra and a lion will agree on space and time. Because that's the part which contains information about space. But it gets more interesting than that. That's the part of the brain called hippocampus. It's very funny. The way people discovered it is that some patient had intractable epilepsy which still happens today. Unfortunately, there are many forms of epilepsy for which there is no cure. And the only thing you can do is to take out that hippocampus so the epileptic seizures, which are essentially elect electrical storms, they don't spread all over the brain and don't, they don't kill you because if it spreads to breathing area or something, you might die. When they took out this part of the brain from this patient called HM, he developed a strange disorder related to memory, which is that he will remember very well what happened in his childhood, but he can't remember the conversation you had with, with him for just a minute ago. You have to reintroduce your name to him every time. There are films like Memento, which are based on that. So new memories from things like conversation or what you do are in hippocampus. So now the mystery starts to thicken. Here is this part of the brain, which was supposed to code for space, all of a sudden, it's a conversation. What the hell is that? 
what's the link between a conversation? We are having a conversation now, but you're seated in one place. You're not going anywhere. What is that? Uh, hippocampus not only gets epilepsy, but that tiny part of the brain, just about that compared to the whole thing, gets all these diseases. And these are just a few names to it. Autism, epilepsy, PTSD, depression, schizophrenia, and many more. Hippocampus is implicated in all of them. And just the cost of treating Alzheimer's is going to be $5 trillion by 2030. Not because people are not trying. Huge number of drugs have been developed for Alzheimer's. Huge number of drugs actually work in mice. None of them work in humans. Why is that? You're going to tell me, Mike, you just told me that hippocampus is the same in mice and humans. Then why are the drugs working in mice, not humans? Because Alzheimer's starts there. So what's missing there? How come it doesn't work? We are going to get an answer to that. As I told you just now, that hippocampus creates this funny thing called space and time that we all agree upon. So that's a good thing to look at. The way hippocampus does that through about 60 years of research is that hippocampus, as soon as you start walking around in space, starts to generate its own rhythm. If you're a musician, that's great. We all remember songs better than speech. That's why I have this funny Indian accent, so you might remember it. Um, it's not real at all. <laughs> <laughs> Just put it on so you might recall this. Uh, but hippocampus actually generates its own rhythm, and you'll hear that. And if you mess with that rhythm, you don't learn. All inside, the rhythm is going on in your brain, and we are going to listen to that. And that's just half of the story. All the synapses and so on, they generate rhythms and so on. And then you go to sleep. And in sleep, hippocampus starts to instruct what it has learned to this giant deep network. And that's how you generate abstraction and memory rather than just writing down every single thing. Right? That's memory, it's content, rather than just writing everything down. So let's get into how that happens. So how does all of this lead to memory? So let's look at some nice pictures. That's an actual picture of the brain, uh, just one millimeter by one millimeter. Each different things are different neurons. You can see different stacks. These are different hypercolumns. This is just one neuron out of all that. So the way we measure what's going on is that first you anesthetize a rat, and then you insert a fine, fine wire with a lot of alchemy that we do right in physics department. As I said, human hair is about 100 to 200 micrometer in diameter. The wires we use, they're just about 40 micrometer in diameter. So much thinner than human hair. We squeeze it in right between the neurons, and we listen to one neuron out of a billion. In rat's brain, it's a billion. It's not an easy thing, but if you have enough bright grad students and undergrads especially, you can do it, right? So we could, not only when they're sitting around, but when the animals are running around and when they're sleeping. That's when it gets interesting. So let's listen to the activity of just one neuron in hippocampus where there's a rat who's just running around in a maze. And nothing nasty happens, he just gets a bit of chocolate. So there he sees running. This is a rendering of the actual data. They crackle is a spike from one neuron. Right? I'm going to shut up now and let you listen to the rhythm. Right? We sped that up, of course, otherwise we'll be here for a long time. <laughs> but the rhythm, if you can tell, is fixed. The rhythm is about this much, about eight times a second. Very, very sharp. If you make it just a little slower, things get messed up. There's no way to make it faster. And if you get rid of it by pharmacology, disaster happens. One of the treatments for Alzheimer's is to make that rhythm stronger by some chemicals, which has its own issues. But rhythm apart, this is a psychedelic room that we have made. The walls are all blue-green. The rat's running around in a maze that's about two meters in diameter. Some experimentalists are throwing random bits of chocolate. The rats like chocolate too. They just go around like a chocolate cleaner. We call it a chocolate rain experiment. They pick up bits of chocolate, and that's all the experiment is. It doesn't have to do anything, but still, 
that one neuron is active only here and nowhere else. Now you might say, well, my, come on. That neuron has this bag, big area in which it's active. That uh, neuron is called a plate cell because it's active as a function of where the rat is. We don't know what the place is, but that's why it's called a place cell. You can say, all right, so that's a place cell, but you can't tell where he is. That's, that's not enough. Hippocampus in the rat brain is about half a million neurons. And if you used a simple vectorial algorithm, which undergrads in my lab do, or I even teach a course on neurophysics, at the end of it, every undergrad in my lab calculates how to do, estimate the information from group of neurons rather than one. Because neurons, unlike us, don't talk, well, you talk and I listen, they all talk at the same time. If you decode that, out of a half a million neurons with just 100 neurons, which we can record at the same time, 100 individual neurons, with a simple algorithm, we can tell in real time where the rat is with this much accuracy, about half a centimeter. Now, that's a problem. Too much, right? If you took me out of this room, brought me here, and shifted me by half a centimeter, and you ask me, Mike, are you in the same place or not? I will not be able to tell you whether I was in the same place or not. We don't have perception of space, which is half a centimeter. And we are doing way better than that with just 100 neurons. So longest adding puzzle has been, why do you need half a million? So Nobel Prize was given in 2014 for the discovery of these place cells. And the puzzle still remain, what the hell? If Alzheimer's, even 20% of neurons go, we lose memory. But with 100 neurons, which is not even a drop in the bucket, uh, you can tell everything what the rat is doing. You can actually decode his dreams. And you can tell where he's going in his sleep, of dreaming of going. You can actually implant memories during sleep in a rat. Don't worry, not in your brain, unless you allow me to put some fine wires. Uh, <laughs> won't hurt at all, trust me. So. What happened? So let's, let, let's, get, let's get a little serious. So if you looked at a typical picture like this, here is the rat running around. The trail is just shown for your visual guidance. Here's another place cell that's active like that in two places. Different neurons tile the whole environment. And with just 100 neurons and a smart undergrad, you can read off his brain and tell where he is. Why are there so many neurons? And what is that space anyway? Why is that neuron active there and not somewhere else? What is that space? So that's when I moved from uh, East Coast uh, to sunny California. These wonderful people told me that this is a nice place to do interesting research. And I thought this is a question at the interface of physics and neurology. So how about the joint appointment between physics and neurology? They didn't even blink. So yep, good idea. So it's one of the few cases where you'll find a person doing physics and neurology. And the weird thing I wanted to do was to build a virtual reality for rats, to figure out what is space. Because when the rat's walking around on the ground, his experience is like this, right? His mouth is here, his nose is here, his whiskers are here, his ears are here, that tiny little schmutz that I can't even see, maybe that's where the neuron is responding. That's a totally different experience. We think that space is made up of what we are seeing, but rats are nocturnal. Maybe they can't even see. I can't just keep cleaning the maze behind him. That will disturb the rat, so that doesn't go. He maze whiskers are so sensitive, the rat's whiskers, that if you move them by 0.3 degrees, 0.3 degrees, there's 360 degrees in the clock, he can perceive it. So we need to remove that, and if we want to figure out, if we want to use rats for understanding human perception, we have to ask them to behave like us. Or we go down on the floor and behave like rats, but I don't think any patients would like to do that. So we build this, you know, several million dollars and several bright people. Here's this virtual reality. The rat sits comfortably. There's nothing nasty that happens because patients who go for diagnosis, nothing should have, nasty should happen. They wear a little tuxedo like this, a little tight. They feel swaddled. They actually like that. We check, we hold him right near the maze to see if he jumps and starts running, then he likes it. If he doesn't jump, then he doesn't like it. We keep him here. As he moves, the sensors are microcontrollers pick up the movement. The whole thing is floating, even though the ball is very heavy due to some fancy technology people in the lab came up with. And that 
goes to a virtual reality engine that sends the image to a Pico projector above his head, which we can't see, goes to the mirror, which is pre-distorted, and it sends the image all around him. So you have the only virtual reality in the world, I'm being uh, intentionally facetious, where he can see his own shadow. There is no other virtual reality in the world that can do that. You put on goggles. If you never put on goggles, you'll think, yeah, what's the big deal? If you put on goggles, the first thing will happen, whoops, where are my legs? Right? You feel the disembodiment. Other good thing about this virtual reality is that when he looks around, he sees exactly what he's supposed to see. When you put it on goggles and you move your head, it takes 17 milliseconds for the computer to calculate. That's too slow. You get dizzy. That's why people get dizzy. That doesn't happen here either. So let's look at, at some experimenter moving it. Just, just the flap at the back is removed. And you can still feel, even though you're looking from the outside, there's some pretty compelling thing. There's some pillars going by and so on. So that's the physics and engineering part, which, you know, million dollars and a couple of years was ready. But now comes the real test. Will the rat buy into it? Will he buy into it? So let's watch, does he buy into or not, if you want to use it. So he's a guy. So he has to do a very simple task. There's a camera above. He has to go underneath that virtual pillar to get a reward. That's all. And reward is a little bit of sugared water right in front of him. Uh, and just to show how nice it is, I'm going to do that too. Mm, great. And while he's drinking that, the pillar just teleports to somewhere else. You can see he goes there now. It's a really hard part. The pillar is behind him. He sees the edge of the table from the corner of his eye, turns away. Right? That's trial number one. Right? Trial number one. He gets that. Now, we are such nasty people, we are going to throw the pillar behind him once again. Trial number two. Watch what he does. Uh, we have put up these videos. You can almost see him looking around. We are looking at the signal in his brain. Turns away even sooner. And if I then let that video run even more, you'll see him even do moonwalk if you put him right close to the cliff. He just walks away like that, as if it's a real cliff. So that works. Uh, and, and what we wanted to, and you can see this is like human being. So one can test rats and human being under same condition. Rather than rats are tested for one memory, humans are tested for another, you can remove that. So, we decided to look into that same neuron. Same neuron we were looking earlier. That's the activity of that neuron. And that's a mess. There's nothing there. And you can use the new information theory and all kinds of fancy math to extract some support vector machines. It says there is nothing there. And you can just tell visually, that's how it looks in the real world. That's how it looks in virtual reality. The map is gone. Now the problem turned upside down. We thought that if we made a maze where the rat has to make the map based on only vision and all the crumbs and smells on the ground are removed, the map will be perfect. So there's no interference. Instead of that, the map went, map went away. And the rat is not lost. He's going around. He's not lost. In fact, detecting the cliff in the virtual reality with just vision is harder. Then in the real world, where smell and tax texture can tell him, the harder the task, the better the brain signal, as we know. But this goes away. So what is that? So several papers later, finally we understood what's going on. And here is it. So all of you musically trained, pay attention. It's the same neuron in virtual reality. So what you hopefully heard is the neuron, the same neuron, had the same rhythm. Space, it's all over the place. But in addition to the rhythm, the music in the brain gets more interesting. The neuron, whenever it's active, it has a motif. 
that motif lasts several seconds. You are you hear that not just one little pop. Turns out the brain is generating some little segments of time. These little segments of time are about one second long and within that one second you have a complicated rhythmic but on top of it additional structure that generates a concept of time. Your brain is generating concepts of time. And that concept of time you are using to measure distances. How much did I travel? Those things are being put together to generate what we call space. What was going on in the real world is that when I took just one little step, everything in the world changed by exactly the same amount, no matter where I am on this planet, no matter which part of evolution. That part has been hardwired in your hippocampus because you don't want to relearn the, the geometry, the topology, the distances and so on of the universe because it's fixed, more or less. When you go into virtual reality, the, you take one step. You can do that experiment right now. I took one step and I didn't freak out if the world came closer to me versus if I was just standing here and the world came to me, I'm going to say, oops. Because your brain knew how much is the movement that you made and as a function of it, how much should the world move. And that movement in the world is in sound. The movement in the world is in vision. It's in smell. It's in airflow. You don't think you hear anything except my voice, but if the AC were to cut out right now, you'll think, oops, something is weird. If you're watching a movie, which is old, and the audio and the video are off by just about 100 milliseconds. Say, I don't like it. Something is wrong. You can tell what's wrong, but you know. Well, in virtual reality, those things are getting shifted. So what we discovered in the process is that the Rolls Royce of virtual reality, which is by far better than anything, the rat likes it. Still, neurons generate their own rhythm but it is not enough to put it all together. Now you know why is it that when we keep testing drugs for the rats and memory, those drugs don't work in humans. Because when the rats are running around with other senses, and this is the actual standard task for testing memory in rats. People know that if you let the rats run around on the ground, they're going to leave scent marks. They're going to pick up little things. They know this. So what they do is they take a giant tank of water, make the water dirty, and hide a little platform just below the surface so the dirty water rat can't see the bottom. Make the water cold. Now the rat has to swim around and find the shortest path to that hidden platform, so-called Morris Water Maze, which is the textbook for every pharmaceutical company. That's a good idea because they got rid of smell and so on. But the bad problem here is now rat is running for his life because he's drowning in cold water. And we know, like he pointed out, that memory is related to emotions. The emotions being generated here are nasty. That process in an entirely different brain region called amygdala, which many of you may know. So that's, you can cure that. If your drug cures his fear for going somewhere, you bring a patient if he is fearful of going somewhere, maybe the patient will learn. But most of the memories that we forget normally or in Alzheimer's are not so fearful memories. In fact, when you have PTSD, when the memories are too strong, which are bad, we actually want them to forget. That's what is going on in hippocampus. So now we want to get into memory. The real memory where we remove the smells, we remove the fear, can what is the nature of memory in hippocampus which is real. So let's look at that. So now the rat has to do something much more difficult. Let me make that fainter so you don't. He has to go in a giant room to an unmarked location to get a reward. And it's really hard. There is no pillar to tell him where to go. Uh, we wrote one paper there. The name is really interesting. I hope you're intrigued because we were super intrigued. Uh, so you can see he's going around. He doesn't know what's going on. When they get stressed, they start grooming themselves. They stand up and look around. So he's going to do that. Uh, you can see that. He doesn't find it. It's hard. You're invited to my lab. 
and the challenge is on to find this. Pretty much most of us fail. And he goes there, once he finds it, he gets a little feedback to say, yes, you did it. It's a sugar water, he gets teleported to another place. No human intervention to pick him up, put him in cold water, and now second trial, boom, he goes there. And there are many, many paths we can show that he can do this task. Uh, let me actually uh, stop the whole thing and say this is still, we are finishing this. And this tells us that he can actually make abstract memories. Nobody tells him go here to get a reward. He has to figure it out based on exploration, create that map from different places even though he's getting teleported. So now we want to get down to that memory. Behavioral memory is one thing, but the memory trace in the brain, where is that? That kind of happy memory such as I walked around and found that pizzeria seven years ago when I was in San Francisco, where was that? That's the task here. Few trials, not hundreds of trials, and a complex task. What I'm going to tell you very briefly, even though this is fascinating, is that the half of the story happens when he's running around in this maze. Other half of the story, equally fascinating, happens when he goes to sleep. If you're interested, this is reasonably easy to read paper. Uh, if you're persistent enough and have enough coffee, you'll go pretty well. What happens is that when the rat runs around, he simply learns the sequence of places that he went. But when he goes to sleep, especially not the dreaming part of sleep that we all think we dream, the non-dreaming part of sleep, so-called non-REM sleep, which is the majority of sleep in us. During that non-REM sleep, his brain zips through the maze 50 times faster than he ever could, 50 times, right? And that's the process in which he's turning those series of movements into a concept. That's a whole different story, a concept of what to do. And in that process, we find that these different sets of neurons, they, they quantize activity, and I was going to talk a lot about it, but just trust my word for it. That's really fascinating. There is a part that keeps behaving as if the whole brain is remembering something throughout the whole non-dream phase of part. And let me come to the final part of how does it all get put together. So everything that I told you so far is about what is going on right here at the cell body. These dendrites are the ones where the synapses are, all these little varicosities that you see, those are the synapses and connections. Those are the 10,000 connections. The t everything that you heard, those beautiful music of the neurons, was from the cell body. Because it's been believed for nearly 100 years. These pictures are 100 years old, not this one, but the, the fact that neurons are like this is literally 100 year old. The idea was that these are like branches of the tree and these synapses are like weeds. They collect the nutrients or the currents, in this case, ionic particles, calcium, potassium, sodium, and chloride, which are all charged particles. Those charged particles flow down to the cell body because of Ohm's law, because this is thicker than this is thinner. And then if the total number of charged particles is sufficiently positive, neuron generate that spike, so-called zeros and ones. Those spikes are the ones you heard. So the idea has been this zeros and ones is when neurons talk to each other. These dendrites where the synapses are, they are just kind of collecting stuff. But that doesn't make sense to a variety of reasons. It's like saying, if I want to understand what all of you are saying, I'll put everything you're saying together in a box and then decide. That's meaningless. If all of you told me 10 different things, if you're 10,000 of you, 10,000 different things, that's going to be garbage in my head if I just cram it all together. But it was not possible to know what was going on because of technological difficulty, because those things are really, really, this is 15 micrometers, this is one micrometer. So once again, bright grad students and undergrads and postdocs in the lab said, can we do something? The standard technique is so-called patch clamp that got the Nobel Prize in 1993. You take a glass pipette, which whose tip is 10 micrometer, and you attach it here. You can measure the signal for about 20, 30 minutes, then the neuron dies. But 10 micrometer is too much for the dendrites. If you make the pipette down to one micrometer, there is no room for liquid, and it kills the dendrite anyway. So you need to do something else. So after a lot of time, 
we thought we are going to use an old Chinese trick, right? Which you all use actually, chopsticks, right? So chopsticks are pretty stiff, but you can trap a little noodle which is way thinner than that and way more fragile, and you can eat. So we, of course, these, these chopsticks are a little more expensive. <laughs> we had to put a bunch of nanoparticles on it and do a bunch of alchemy. Carbon nanotubes don't like to stick to the wire, so we had to put gold particles. So all that stuff and some amazingly bright people uh, in the lab and about six years of really hard work, we recorded the signal literally for the first time in human history, exactly where the memories are being stored. This has never been done either in brain alive or in mouse or a rat or even in a brain slice. Because even in a brain slice, you don't have these little chopsticks. You can't just poke it. So what is the signal, right? So I'm going to shut up because this is so exciting for me that I'll just go on and on. So I let you listen, and I hope you have picked up that music. Listen to that. And let me crank up the volume so it really hurts your ears. All right, ready? So the first thing that should hit you is the bass. It's not that that part is simply collecting the currents and sending to the cell body. That little patch of the neuron called the dendrite is generating its own gigantic signal, right? And that signal is of a totally different quality. You can tell it has a huge amount of bass to it. I have not changed the settings here. The neurons, when they speak, the cell body speech is very high pitched. You could hear ta 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 ta. This is a giant bass. And the language here is pretty funky. The language is both based on the shapes, so the language within the neurons. The neuron has 10,000 different synapses. These parts are talking to each other. The neuron is not just a simple thing. These parts are talking to each other using a complicated language in which you are, they're using different kinds of syllables. It's not just zeros and ones. There are a variety of syllables. And when you put it all together and look at what the neural activity patterns are, when the rat is simply trying to find where he is in that maze, in the virtual maze, this is what you see. And if you think this is enormously complicated, thank you. <laughs> That's what it is. The memory there is supremely complex. It has no information or very little information about where the rat is. But it has information about which way he's facing with respect to the reward, which is the memory that he wants, the happy memory, where the reward is, even though it's not visible. These neurons care for which.